at 10.15 on my, my watch. Um, welcome everyone to Spiderwebs of Progression. This is Jamie Thayer. He will be uh, our presenter today. Um, I do ask that everyone turn off their video and mute themselves um, so we do not distract Jamie from this wonderful presentation. Um, this is recorded. Uh, it will be posted on our YouTube link later. Um, I also like to thank all of our sponsors. And uh, yeah, Jane, like I said, I'll give you a 10 minute warning, five minute warning. All right, perfect, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, get started. So with this presentation, it's gonna be um, part lecture, part demonstration. Um, during the demonstrations, I'd highly encourage you guys, if it's um, okay with everybody, to um, participate if you can. Um, with this being a virtual conference, it offers a unique opportunity that we can actually get up and move, um, that most of us um, looking at the attendance list or participation list currently, a lot of us are um, fitness focused people. So getting to actually get hands on and um, get involved is something that we don't always have that opportunity at these conferences. So with this one being a virtual and you being in your own space, hopefully um, you have the ability to get up and um, interact with some of these things. Um, if you can, during those times, feel free to turn on uh, your video and um, that kind of allows me to get some feedback to um, see if anybody's having any issues or anything like that. Uh, outside of that, um, at about the 10 minute marker, 10-15, uh, um, I'll leave time for questions at the end. So while I probably won't be answering questions during this presentation, uh, we have the chat, which if you put the questions in there, we can read through after and kind of start answering those. Um, so feel free to use the chat as much as possible. Um, so if you're, you have a question, um, it's right there so we can go back and look at it. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, this is the first full virtual presentation I've done, so bear with me. All right, can everybody see that screen so far? Hopefully, if you have your video on, maybe not. Yeah, okay, hopefully, because we're gonna go ahead and go. All right, so this is Spiderwebs of Progression. Move this monitor real quick. All right, so this is gonna be um, part lecture, part interactive. Uh, so whenever it's more interactive, I am gonna change the camera angle, step back and demonstrate, like I said before, hopefully um, you're comfortable enough or you have the space that you can also join in during those demonstrations. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Thayer, or I'm here James Thayer, kind of go by both. Um, it's just easier sometimes to have the more professional one. I'm from Washburn University and I'm the assistant director of fitness and wellness. Uh, hey, Jamie. Yep. We see your presentation mode, not the presentation alone. I don't know which one you're wanting us to see. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, okay. Yeah. Is everybody okay with presentation mode? <laughs> or like we see your presenter mode. So we see if you have notes throughout your presentation, we see that version. Let me change that real quick. No, uh, Jamie, it's in the share screen option that you chose is why we're seeing this one. There's a separate option you can choose that'll show just the, the main screen. Um, does anybody want to walk me through that? I apologize for this. So you should be able to select which monitor um, they can see. And once you go, once you go into your presentation, you can go to your display settings and switch the monitors that we see. This happened to me and my staff let me get halfway through my presentation before they wanted to tell me. <laughs> um, let me try this.
So now go to display settings up there in the center and swap presenter view and slideshow. Boom. Perfect. All right, I appreciate that. So um, now we'll actually get started. Um, so this presentation is spider webs of progression. Um, we're gonna be learning to create effective exercise programming for long-term success with spider webs of progression. Um, you're gonna receive uh, virtual learning and demonstrations for exercise progression, regression, and an index scales. Uh, we're also gonna look at integrating mobility, stability, and strength pillars. Um, a couple things to keep in mind going through with this, um, that it's a systems principle, it's not a principle approach. So what I mean by that is, um, this is meant to be applied to whatever type of program or system that you're running. It's not, um, it doesn't operate in isolation, it's meant to integrate with programming. Um, for this presentation, it's driven towards personal trainers, but it could be applied to uh, group fitness instructors, could be applied to coaches. Um, so just keep that in mind that with this, we're going to skip a couple levels, um, pass some of the basics and just have an expectation uh, of previous knowledge or baseline knowledge. Um, but with that being said, it, um, all questions are welcome. So if you're not sure, you don't understand about something, please ask. Um, this is meant to be an organizational chart. So whenever you later on see the spider webs up progression, it's really meant to help you organize your programming. Um, it's meant to be critical thought applications. So we're thinking about how to apply these things into our own programming and identifying if there's any holes or any things that we're missing. Um, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, I'm biased in my experiences and my viewpoint. So by all means, don't take what I'm saying is the gold standard. This is a lot of my opinion and a lot of my experience. Um, so if you find valuable things in that, feel free to um, incorporate those, but always question um, myself, other presenters, and really think about the application of any of this information. Um, last one, we're all here to learn. Ask questions. There's no such thing as a um, dumb question that this is your opportunity to um, get in-depth information that we can go back and forth and we can open up a dialogue um, for anything that you're, you don't understand or you're looking to apply. So we're gonna start with the uh, mobility, stability and strength pillars. So mobility is the ability to access greater ranges of motion. Um, stability is your ability to resist force and strength is the ability to exert force. These are gonna be the tenets or the pillars that set this whole program in place and allow us to, to continue to progress and build upon um, our programming. Um, before going into it, I'd like to bring up a couple things um, that words matter. So whenever we're an instructor, whenever we're a coach, whenever we're a personal trainer, the words that we're using, they hold value and how we use those, we need to be sure that we're using those correctly. Even if we know what they mean, but, um, but it's understood from our client from a different way, that's an opportunity for us to educate our clients and uh, create value in ourselves, create value in our program um, and become a resource. So a couple of those that I'd like to point out um, that are sometimes confused or um, used interchangeably in our field is uh, stability versus strength. So again, like the previous slide, uh, stability is the ability to resist force, whereas strength is the ability to produce force. Um, so this means whenever something is weak, it needs strengthened. And when something's lacking stability or instability, it means it needs stability. So sometimes we wanna use um, something's weak and we need to strengthen it whenever it's really just unstable. Um, sometimes like we'll, we'll look at, um, uh, somebody having issues with a, uh, squatting pattern. And we might say that their glutes are weak when really it might not be weak. They might just have some instabilities that we need to address that makes them, um, more able to, uh, transfer that force. Cause if we're looking at, we're looking at stability that it's a force transference from upper and lower extremities, 
the, that ability to stabilize allows that force more of a direct pathway and um, limits uh, energy leakage. So whenever we're thinking about stability and strength, they're not the same things and how we approach those are gonna be different. So keep that in mind that um, is it a strength issue where something is weak and we need to make it stronger or is it instable and we need to make it more stable or add stability to it? Um, there's a difference between muscle function and mus muscle action. So uh, kind of the definitions that I go off of those is um, on function, it's how we move and breathe. Um, it's the sum of actions happen happening intrinsically. With muscle action, it's a lot more simple. It's um, origin to insertion. It's uh, pretty black and white. Um, again, with those, I think it's important. Um, sometimes we can get lost in uh, functional training or the function of an exercise in the application to everyday life. So that's how I like to separate those is function is how we move and breathe and how that's applied. Uh, looking at turning muscles on or waking muscles up, um, your muscles are always on. Uh, unless they have been severed, um, they're working, we might have some compensation patterns that are making other muscle groups more dominant than they should be, but your muscles are always on. Um, it's not like a light switch where we can turn it on and off and just deactivate our muscles. Uh, we just might not be using them as appropriately. Uh, so, for example, think of the glute med. Glute med is an external rotator and abductor of the hip, uh, but it's not stabilizing their hip. It's receiving a message from the unstable parts of the body. And so it's trying to, it in itself isn't necessarily stabilizing. It's doing those actions. It's the other intrinsic uh, muscles along with uh, the glute med that are stabilizing that hip. Um, another way to think about it is, um, the bubble in a level. So if you've ever used a level, uh, the bubble doesn't stabilize the level and the level isn't level unless you know how to use the bubble. So those two things have to go together and we have to use those in unison, but understand them separate, separately to make sure we're using them appropriately and efficiently. Uh, the last thing I want to point out is good and bad exercise. So um, from my perspective, there's not a good or bad exercise. It's all about how we implement it and all about how we integrate it. That some exercises are more appropriate for people than others, um, but it's not as binary as good or bad. It's just, is that appropriate for that client at that time? Going back to stability and, um, somebody have a question? Oh, okay. Um, so with this presentation, I'm going to highlight stability a lot because I think that's the missing piece that can get lost sometimes in our program um, that we've had a huge emphasis towards mobility. And that's great. Um, being able to assess the greater ranges of motion um, and being able to control those. Um, another one I should have put up previously is the difference between mobility and flexibility, that mobility is passive, flexibility is, or Flexibility is passive, mobility is active. Um, so with stability, sometimes it can get lost in that medium of mobility, stability, strength, and we want to go straight from mobility right into strengthening, but we're missing that opportunity of stability, of being able to control that newfound range of motion that we found in our mobility. Um, so two things that we'll work on today is um, tenets of stability and how to progress or regress those. Uh, so the two ways to uh, progress those or regress those would be deviate the center of mass. So change the center of mass closer to our body further away, adding longer levers or shorter levers. And we can broaden or reduce the base of support. Um, an example of this is like the Bulgarian split squat. The, in that we have uh, two points of contact. So one foot's on the ground, one foot is uh, elevated behind us. Um, that in that movement in itself, we have gone unilaterally. So we've created um, some sense of stability needing to perform that exercise. If we're looking at deviating the center of mass, we can extend our leg behind us and make it a longer lever 
or if we're looking at broadening the base of support, we can look at um, external stabilizers to assist with this if we're trying to broaden it or reduce it. Um, so if we're trying to broaden that base of support, we might take um, a dowel rod in one hand or both hands to help use us um, to work through that motion, but stay stable, even though we're trying to get stability out of this, it's a way to progress that. And then going from that two dowel model down to a one dowel till, it, till eventually we can get to um, no dowel and being able to intrinsically stabilize. All right, so this is gonna be our first breakout session. So if you have the space, if you have the opportunity, um, I highly encourage you to get involved with some of these. We'll do a couple breakout sessions as we go through. Um, a lot of these are going to be unilaterally focused and incorporating stability. Uh, we will go through tenets of uh, mobility and stability later on into the session, but we're going to do a couple of these individually, and um, then we're going to integrate them back in later on. So, like I said, if you have the opportunity, highly encourage you to take advantage and get up and move since we're fitness people and we rarely get to do this at nursing conferences. Okay, so I'm gonna try my best to do, uh, let me bring that a little closer, hopefully that'll help you guys. Um, so I'm gonna try my best to demonstrate these um, and whenever we're going through, again, if you have that opportunity, I encourage you to get up and move around a little bit we'll go back and forth with this a couple of times. So it might be a little boring if I'm the only one on the screen doing it. All right, so the first one we're gonna look at is sprinter pose. And with this, it's very, very um, reduced. It's very, very simple. I use this in some of uh, my assessments um, or my movement screens before even creating programs. So all the sprinter pose is, is coming up on one leg, holding one foot up and seeing if we can stabilize and balance here. Um, we can always add challenges to it by extending the levers if we want, but it's that simple. So with this going through, and we're going to incorporate some breathing patterns into it. Um, we'll go through a full inhale and exhale, going through uh, diaphragmatic breathing. So breathing into our stomach instead of our chest. So try to push into your stomach instead of allowing that chest to rise. Do two more. Okay, hopefully you joined me in on that. Otherwise, I'm just standing here and doing it by myself. Uh, so the next one is gonna be our RDL. And so now we're taking that balance that, or that uh, stability that we were just working on and we're doing these in separate parts. I'll show you how to combine those later. For the RDL, we're going through, we're, we'll start in that sprinter pose if possible. If not, we'll reduce down um, and just start it here. Again, same things with stability as before, that if we need to modify it, uh, we can always shorten the lever instead of a long leg, we can go to um, our knee bent. Uh, we can also add dowels, walls, table, anything that we have available, we can add that to um, add external stability. So whenever we're going through, extending out, trying to maintain that balance, coming up, um, some people, might need that stopping point. So using that uh, toe to stop, build, reset, and start integrating those breath patterns as we go through. So a full inhale, holding, bracing, going through the movement, and then exhaling. Go ahead and do that a couple times. If you're doing it with me, I can't see. So I'm just going to assume every single person is doing this and enjoying it. All right, so the next one, um, if you still need time, continue to do these. Uh, next one is gonna be a walk and lunge. So we're gonna continue to build upon some of the patterns that we've already set through uh, hip extension, through uh, knee flexion, into now a walking lunge. So we'll go through into that walking lunge, stepping forward, suggesting slight internal rotation, opposite arm to opposite knee, and driving back up. If we want to go into that sprinter pose, we can, uh, but we don't have to, but starting to progress that. Um, so whenever we're going through and doing some of these things, um, 
before we move on to the hip airplane, some important things to consider. Um, in the RDL, what is your foot doing? So if you went and did the RDL, was your foot here or did you have dorsiflexion? And think about the intention behind what we're doing into these because the warm up should integrate into the program itself. So a limp foot might ne not necessarily be the biggest deal, but whenever we think about how are we setting up patterns to apply into our program, do we have that foot dorsiflex that is ready to take on ground forces? Or is it just hanging out here limp and we're having you dress out whenever we're stepping down? So little things like this, if we can think about, okay, anything that we're gonna do, that foot is gonna to have to be dorsiflex, that it's gonna to have to be prepared to absorb those ground forces. Let's start putting those patterns in, uh, in the warmups, and that's gonna to continue to integrate into the workout itself. Um, with that, whenever we're, whenever we're going through, we're trying to add a bit of a cognitive exercise during some of these, we're trying to get people to start thinking about in the warm up. So we don't have to cue as much. We already set that baseline when we go into the workout itself. And it's gonna be more efficient for us in the long term because we're already making those connections. We're already giving those cues. So instead of the long description of why this is important during the workout and having to take time away from that, we can set that precedent in the warm up. Uh, the last one we're going to go to is the hip airplane. So with this one, this can be a difficult one um, for a lot of people. So all these aren't necessarily the uh, most basic exercises or warm-up patterns to go to. There's always progressions and reductions of any of these. Um, so hip airplane can be um, a little bit more of a difficult one, but if somebody is able to incorporate this into their warmups. It's a higher, more advanced level of warmup and it opens up opportunities for you as a trainer, coach, instructor to um, start adding more complexity to the exercise. So hit the airplane, we're going through. It's similar to the RDL, but we're gonna get into that RDL position, but now we're sinking this hip into internal rotation and external rotation. And going back, internal rotation, external rotation. And again, there, there's ways to start incorporating that or integrating that that aren't as high level where stability is the deterring factor in our ability to do that. Whenever we go through some of the mobility stuff, I'll show you ways to mobilize that without having that tenant of stability right off the get-go. Move this back up here. All right, so whenever we're looking at um, these warm-ups, whenever we're looking at our pre-work for our exercise, we're thinking about uh, creating gatekeepers to the program. So what that means, it's gonna, it's gonna let us know as the trainer, the instructor, the coach, um, if our client, if our participant is ready to take on the demands of the program that we've set, or if we need to modify and change based on what we're assessing, based on what we're seeing in the warmups. Um, this offers a plug and play model uh, to programming using that mobility stability pre-work. So some of the things I pointed to whenever, whenever we were going through our stabilizers, those would be gatekeepers that I look to. The, Whatever level it is, if we've advanced our client to that point, are they able to maintain that during the work, uh, warm up? And is that going to be integrated into the workout? That if I'm noticing compensation patterns, if I'm noticing instabilities, that diving right into the workout might not be appropriate that day or at that time for the client, that it gives us an opportunity to look at modifying it, but also gives us an opportunity to look if what we're putting in for our prehab work, for our warm up, if it's effective. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by a plug and play model. It gives us that assessment going through. If we're getting the results for the primary exercise that we're looking for, if it's not there yet, and we need to address something else or need to approach it a little bit differently. Once we get into the webs, this might make a little bit more sense. But again, going through, 
having gatekeepers in place through our warm allows us to assess if there's a lack of mobility, allows us to assess if there's a lack of stability and allows us to integrate primary movement patterns while focusing on whatever primary uh, exercises that we're looking to drive adaptation for. All right, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but this is starting, uh, kind of a starting principle of uh, building a web. So if anybody here is an arachnophobe, I apologize, there's only a couple of pictures of real spiders on here. So just look away um, when that next one's coming. This is just a drawn spider, so hopefully no issues on this. But a couple things that I wanna point out with, in, with this spider web and kind of what got me on thinking about this model or this organizational chart is whenever we look at how a spider creates a web, it has anchor points, it builds connections between those anchor points. And then whenever we look at the center of the web, it's the center is the strongest. Um, it can absorb the most force and its goal is to catch the prey. So if we try to apply that to exercise, we're looking at whatever our primary exercise is, that that's gonna need to absorb the most force, but we have to build layers to be able to get there. We have to look at everything we're doing outside of that primary exercise to reinforce that web or reinforce that structure to make sure that we're gonna hold up whenever we're trying to apply load into that. Um, so that's why whenever we get into it later, uh, your primary should be a driving factor because that's gonna set our web and allow us to build off of that. So now if we're looking at how to, um, or how those incorporate into an exercise program. So if we're looking at the outer frame of the web, uh, we're looking at the needs, the wants, the frequency. Um, frequency is gonna be a huge tenet of this because it's, it looks at balancing out the web. It looks at if we're overloading one side or if we're creating issues um, not addressing things. Looking at the anchor points of it, so pillars of the program. What are we trying to achieve with this? Uh, what things do we need to address? That we're setting those pillars right off the beginning and allowing us to start building from there uh, based on whatever the client needs, um, based on the things that we need to address. Um, building connection because it shares uh, focuses and um, allows for that force distribution. So the volume that we're putting into the web that we can distribute it if we have those connections across. So we're looking at the outer layers associated with it as C1, D1, E1, that'll make sense in the next couple slides, um, building layers of progression. So if we're starting here, how do we progress down to a squat? For this, um, to kind of save time, in a lot of the slides, I'm just focusing on a squat because trying to cover everything is gonna take way more than an hour. So for this, we're just gonna focus on um, building a spider web into a barbell back squat. Um, but trying to build layers into that from that center point and back out that we can make sure we're accomplishing um, all the tenets that go into a squat and addressing any issues that we might have with the squat or any limitations or modifications that need to be made for the client. Um, and then that center point is catching the prey. Uh, the center point, again, is the strongest. It can absorb the most force. So when we're looking at our A's and B's, um, those are gonna be larger movements. Those are um, gonna be some of our more traditional exercise like a squat, a bench press, a deadlift, things like that that we can drive adaptation through a greater load. Um, that doesn't mean that Every single client needs a A1 to be a barbell back squat. We'll get into that here in a little bit, but just thinking about whatever that center point is, is gonna be the focus of how we're programming and how we're building around that. All right, so when we're going through and we're, we're looking at our warm up, this is um, one model of the spider web um, applied to our warm up. So if we're looking at the middle of uh, this web, it's the working set one, 25%, working set two, 50%, working set three, 75%. Um, at the top of the web, there's the unilateral movements. At the bottom of the web, there's the bilateral movements. And then we've divided out for the squat of knee flexion and hip extension. 
So those are one, those are the pillars that we're using in this example to help divide out where our emphasis for the program is. Um, the other thing that you'll notice, the reason that there's three of these spider webs is because whenever we go and we look at the program, we're gonna do this model three times, getting to our working set of whatever that primary exercise is. Uh, so if you notice um, right under unilateral movements, there's M1. So our mobility one, uh, mobility stability one, and then stability one. So we're doing each of those point by point by point, building into our working set of whatever that primary exercise is. Um, these are just arbitrary percents, 25, 50, 75, into whatever our working weight is. So if we're looking at, let's say we're doing a 100 pound barbell uh, back squat, our working set would be 25 pounds, 50, or our working set would be 100. Building up to that point, we have 25 pounds, we have 50 pounds, we have 75 pounds, and now we've gotten to our working set of 100, but through that, we've rotated our mobility, stability, and strength and built upon that, um, going back to that plug and play model to see if it's effective or not. Because if, as we go and we're doing this warm up, it's not meeting the demands that that primary exercise needs, we need to change something out. We need to address something that we're missing in the program. And this gives us the ability to look at that to see if it's effective or not. All right, we're gonna go through another breakout session. So again, if I can see you on camera, expectations and hopes are that you join in this. Um, this one, we're gonna go through uh, three variables um, of uh, mobility drills. Um, with each one, we're just gonna do three to four times to save time. And let me adjust so we can back up again. Again, if you have the opportunity, please join in. This might be some new uh, mobility exercise, but with this, we're gonna look at addressing um, internal and external rotation and some isolation moves for uh, our hips to help prepare us for the squat. Um, so with this one, the first one is the figure four hold. So we've gotten into a figure four position, keeping the not upright posture the best we can. If we need to modify this, we can always put braces with our hands on the back. If you need, we can always add yoga blocks to it to try to get that upright position because it's important. So going through with the figure four ISO hold, we're just lifting that leg up and trying to, we're trying to see if our client has the ability just to maintain this position. Um, and if they have that control and if they're able to stabilize here. If you're doing this along with me and you're experiencing a cramp in your quad, just put it down, nothing wrong with that, and come back when you can. So we're going through and we're holding this. Um, I like to associate with this with breath work instead of typical time reps or sets. So again, going back in and start integrating that breath work the best we can, we'll do both sides. Next one is the 90-90 position. So we're going through, we still have that front figure four position, but now we're moving that back leg into um, a bent knee position. It's called 90-90 if you're not familiar with it because we're trying to create 90 degree angles with both legs. That front leg is gonna focus on internal rotation. That back leg is gonna focus on external rotation. So whenever we're going through, First goal is just to sit in this 90-90 position. Can you get your client comfortable if this is appropriate for them? Um, some clients this won't be appropriate for. Uh, so just know where you need to modify or know if this is appropriate to incorporate into. If they can't do a figure four ISO hold. This is an appropriate exercise for them. Same thing, that we're trying to get in this upright position that we're comfortable, that we're not slumping here and putting everything into a lateral effects, uh, flexed lumbar spine. We're trying to keep upright, appropriate position. If we go into this, we're losing the whole point of it and we're setting four movement patterns going into the exercise. So we can always add one or two bases to get back to that upright position. If we can come here, great. We're just setting in this position. Um, if we're trying to advance this, but not ready for the 90-90 uh, activator, which we'll do next, can always just rock into it and see if we can find comfortability or we can address some of those in ranges because that's what we're trying to do in mobility. We're trying to access greater ranges of motion. We're trying to send a signal to our brain that 
allows um, any tightness to loosen up because we're going, we're preparing to integrate that into our workouts. Next with the 9090 activator, again, all these build upon each other, that these in themselves should be gatekeepers. If you can't do one, you shouldn't jump right into the 9090 activator just because it looks cool or because it looks hard. You as the trainer, coach, instructor, you're the one that has to allow those gates to be open for your client. So if your client's not ready for it, it's okay to hold them back. It's okay to work on progressing these individually instead of trying to go clear to the full spectrum of it. Uh, the last one is the 9090 activator. So we're going through, we're seeing if we can move this leg around, we're going through internal external rotation. We want to make it more difficult. We can work on not touching the ground and seeing the control that we can maintain. All right, for the next one, we're going to go through, make sure, we'll lower this a little bit. All right, for the second half of this, we're going to go from a kneeling position. So keep in mind with the kneeling position that we have a hip flexion and hip extension. So this is uh, adding to that base of support that we're reducing the gravitational pull from an upright position and longer levers down to a more accommodating position that clients might be better able to work through some positions and prepare ourselves for the workout going into it. So with the half kneeling rock and lunge, we're just in this lunge position, but from a kneeling um, position, you can always put um, a, Walk, a pillow, a blanket, an uh, ab mat, anything you have under the knees if your client needs that. And all we're doing is rocking back and forth. We're trying to integrate um, some dorsiflexion, trying to keep an upright position, and practicing our breathing with this. Once we've worked through that, we can look at um, do we need to address any uh, lateral positions? Again, with this, why I like the half kneeling lateral hinge because it allows for that leg to go out and us to go into a hinge position, which a lot of people might have issues with from a standing position, sinking into that hinge or doing it appropriately. So with this, this makes it stationary, it brings it down, makes it more stable. And so we're just going through and seeing if we can stabilize with it. Can always put our hands on the ground and push back and hold longer into those positions as needed. And then we're going to bring it up for a uh, lateral sway. So with this, it's not going to be held points. It's just going to be kind of greasing the grooves or painting the corners of our hips. So to an appropriate level, um, having your client go to the depth that they need, um, not the necessarily the depth that I'm showing, because uh, we're all trying to work within our own capacities. We're not trying to get to someone else's capacity. And you as a uh, trainer, you're the one that has to set that standard and let them know if they need to reduce it or not. Um, again, if they can't do the half kneeling lateral hinge, the lateral sways probably isn't going to be appropriate for them. So we're going through um, through a uh, uh, more lateral uh, position, and we're just going to start hinging into it, squatting into it, and not holding those long points like a lateral lunge. We're just swaying back and forth. Trying to keep that upright position. We don't have to be all the way here where we're emphasizing a uh, huge uh, lumbar extension. We're just trying to keep a neutral spine and just going back and forth, making sure that our client can own these positions. All right. So then building off of the mobility. Um, want to hit on unilateral loading real quick because a lot of the programming I'm doing for mobility is focused on that unilateral movement um, because it gives us a greater opportunity to focus on compensation patterns that need to be addressed. So a uh, quote um, I'm using here is if you cannot go through hip and knee flexion on uh, one leg, you should not be loading it on two legs. If any compensation patterns that are apparent in unilateral loads, they're gonna show up in bilateral, but they might be able to hide those a little bit better. So 
if you're not looking out for them, um, you might not be able to see them as well. But whenever they're exposed in a unilateral movement, we have a greater ability to focus on them and uh, potentially correct them or modify them to a more appropriate position for the client. Um, so for example, a, a split stance lunge, some of the focus points that we're going through where we have a stabilizer with it, uh, we're looking at hip extension in the back leg, we're looking at internal rotation of the adductors, we're uh, trying to integrate an arm drive through gait mechanics, um, sink down into the midfoot and um, avoid the front foot or front knee caving um, or driving forward over the ankle. So gonna go back to a little breakout if you can. So a modified position of what we just went through earlier with the um, single leg movements, split stance front lunge as we're going through, we can sink down in this, that now we have two bases of support that might be more appropriate than um, a forward lunge. Uh, we can also add dowels to it that uh, integrate more stability, but using these key points to make sure that they're, they're doing the movement pattern appropriately and that that's gonna integrate into the exercise or into the program that we have prepared for them. And if they're not looking at how to uh, still do the program, but modify it for that day. Cause keep in mind that um, even though we've gone through our assessments with clients that, okay, they have appropriate uh, hip mobility, have appropriate ankle mobility, that might change depending on the day and depending on the stressors that have already been applied in the day and in the week that sometimes we're gonna to need to modify our program just because we think we wrote the best program or a great program. Um, if your client has an inability to do that program, it's trash, uh, plain and simple, but we have to make sure that we always have that availability to modify as needed. All right, so going back into um, some of the earlier warm-ups that we looked at. So now instead of them operating in isolation, we're gonna look at how to add a bit more complexity or how to couple these um, to be more time efficient. So I'm just gonna pick one of these um, to go through just because we're running out on time. Um, but just want to incorporate that there's different ways to go through and different ways to um, couple these once we've advanced past just the basics. So move this one more time. Okay, so we'll go with the top one of the sprinter pose into an RDL with uh, arm mechanics and a forward lunge. So whenever we're going through, we've gone into our sprinter pose position, RDL position, incorporating that arm mechanic and driving through and back up. Again, we, we wanna make sure that our client can do each individually before we try to couple them or before we try to add complexity to what we're doing. Uh, let's see, we'll pick on one of these um, ab exercises. So something else um, I've started playing with and something uh, to think about in your own programming is where you're putting your core exercise, um, your trunk exercise, your abs, whatever you want to call it, where you're putting that in your program. And is it beneficial there um, or is there a purpose for it to be there? So a lot of us probably have traditionally seen abs at the end, um, just doing ab exercise at the end because that's where they've always been and we've never really questioned it. Um, so something I've started reconsidering with this is using that primary exercise to consider if it's, if we're preparing appropriately for it with not just with mobility, but stability, because what our core's intention is, is to maintain rigidity and oppose forces that act, are acting upon it. Um, so with each of these, it's, it's not a traditional crunch or um, setup. It's more of a static hold and us trying to integrate um, some of that rigidity into our core to prepare for the um, whatever the demands of that primary exercise is. Um, so we'll go through a bird dog real quick, just because this 
this one um, is done inappropriately or could be improved upon a lot of times. So whenever we're looking at the bird dog position, we're going through and we're thinking about um, a lot of times you might see whether it's on Instagram or uh, just people trying to do it faster is higher is better. Because in fitness, we think about that more is better. If this is good, more is better. Um, you as the trainer need to pull back on that and make sure your client's doing it appropriately and not creating poor movement patterns that are going to play out into the program before or the program that we're trying to build towards. So whenever we're going through bird dog, uh, shoulders stacked over the wrist, hips over the knees, we're going through opposite arm, opposite hand. And instead of going up, trying to reach as high, I like to cue reach to the walls. So we're going through and trying to reach out, then up. So if you notice there's a difference in there's a difference in the lumbar extension from trying to go up to trying to go to the walls and bring it back in and out. And we're trying to maintain that rigidity. Um, if we need to regress that movement, we can always put a hand on the ground if we want to progress that. Um, does anybody have a suggestion of how you would progress a bird dog? Okay, so oh, somebody gonna go? Okay, so one way to uh, progress it might be a um, hovering instead of your knees on the ground, lifting those off the ground and uh, giving less base of support. Um, another one that uh, is more transferable is like an ab wheel because with the bird dog, we're trying to, we're trying to avoid uh, lumbar extension and same thing in an ab wheel. The whole point of it is to avoid that lumbar extension and maintain that rigidity. So that's a way to progress it. If we're looking at how to um, regress it, we're going to use those tenets of stability again, and we're looking at adding a base of support. So think about the position that you're in with the bird dog. Think about flipping that upside down. And that's just a dead bug with greater support, because now instead of your knees and hands on the ground, your back is on the ground. So you have a greater base that we're able to do the exact same um, mechanics for. All right, and then with our um, building to the actual program, we're looking at um, kind of that same model that we used in the mobility, stability, strength, but now this is applying it to the program. So we're looking at our A1, our uh, B1, and those are gonna be greater focuses of load that we're gonna put higher demand um, more complex exercises in those. So those are gonna be like more traditional of our uh, back squat, our deadlift, our bench. They can be those things, but if they're not appropriate for your client, think of the modifications that go into those. And now that's gonna be your focus. And then from there, we're building out, um, addressing any uh, weak points or um, looking at how we can add, add uh, volume without complexity. Um, so an example of this, uh, if we're looking at how to define our web. So a squat is a bilateral load that's um, through the sagittal plane. So um, something if we need to incorporate more hip extension could be more uh, good mornings and knee flexion could be Bulgarian split squats. If we're looking at a regression of those through a unilateral emphasis, um, looking at the hip extension through a B stance RDL, um, and then our uh, knee flexion through a foot, front foot elevated split squat. Um, again, these aren't the most reduced, but they're different variations that could be incorporated over not just that exercise of the day, but the exercise program and gives us the ability to continue to progress. Um, whenever we start incorporating some exercises into it, this might be um, one way that you could look at the spider web of progression. So, as we notice, um, there's the back squat as the A1. Um, built around it, the B1 uh, Bulgarian split squats. On the right hand side for the knee flexion unilateral movement, um, below that, the front squat for knee flexion uh, bilateral movement. Um, if we go to the other side, uh, single leg RDL or good mornings. Um, building out from there, we're looking at starting to add volume. So um, as we add volume, we 
we don't want the demand of stability to be as high. We want to start taking that away so we can have a greater emphasis on um, adding volume or time to the exercise that we're doing. So we might look at adding a, a quad extension or a hamstring curl. Um, if we're moving further or past that of like a D exercise, we might look at um, leg press. So instead of trying to overload that through a one rep max, um, looking at how can we add volume to that in a, in a movement that's pretty well supported externally and we can drive volume through muscle and not as great uh, dependency on stability or uh, complexity of some of our other exercises. Um, so if you're wondering how all this goes together, like how to really imagine this into a program, here's a template example of um, that I like to incorporate. So this would be a four day exercise program. And if we look through um, on the left, it has the mobility, mobility, stability, uh, stability model that we talked about for our warmups. And then below that, it's our A1, B1 for our load and C, D, E for our accessories. So as we're looking through from top to bottom, each one is a day over the week. And it allows us to um, put notes in to focus on um, the demands of some of those things and try to spread that out across the week instead of just viewing it in a program itself. So instead of just the micro cycle, we can get more um, involved with a, a meso and micro or macro cycle um, to view it a little bit more clearly. Um, keep in mind that the medium is the message. So what does the modality speak to that we're using? Um, a simplified version of this is barbell equals load, uh, dumbbell equals distance, cable equals time. Um, medium is the message is a coined term from Marshall uh, McLuhan. Uh, he was a Canadian philosopher um, that focused on media. Uh, so how I am incorporating this into exercises we're looking at drive, driving adaptation through movement. The medium at which it is delivered far exceeds the limitations of the message. So if we're trying to get into hip extension um, and knee flexion, it's less important the exercise we're doing and more important the action that we're trying to integrate into our system. Um, barbell is the greatest tool for adaptation or load. Um, so we need to look at if we're using that appropriately. If, if we're getting to the point where we're using it for 20 reps, um, there might be a better way to look at that depending on, um, depending on how dense your program is on bilateral movements or barbell loaded movements that we might start looking at more externally supported exercises um, to integrate, to take off some of that stress throughout the week and throughout the program block. Um, a couple of key points you could look at, again, none of this is um, set in stone, it all can be adapted, but just for quick references, we could look at driving adaptation through a barbell. Uh, we have the ability to load it the greatest of anything else, so it has the highest intensity. That um, could be six reps or less. Um, if we're looking at dumbbell as the second highest loader, uh, there's some internal stabilization to it. Um, it allows us to drive time and also distance. We can look at more of a hypertrophy program um, for that of eight to 12. Um, sorry, running out on time. Uh, looking at cable machines. So those attenuate around muscle length. So think of whenever we're using those that um, if you've ever shot a compound bow that as it lengthens, um, if you notice at the beginning, it's hard, middle, it lightens up and at the end uh, kind of lets go and locks into that position. So a cable machine, the cams work similar to a compound bow where whenever our muscle, all right, so whenever our muscle is fully lengthened and fully shortened, it's, those are the weakest points. Um, in our ability to produce force, um, these are weak points. Whereas whenever it's at our mid range, that's the opportunity to drive the greatest force. So if we're looking at um, a cable machine that it attenuates around that, that it lessens off of our fully lengthened and our fully shortened and applies to that mid range. Um, so if we're trying to get more of a mid range driver through that, um, 
cable machines are a great option. Uh, the opposite of that would be like bands. Whenever a band is fully lengthened, um, it has the most resistance profile. And that's typically whenever our muscle is fully shortened. So here it's at a weak point. So we need to be aware of how we're integrating and how we're using bands that we don't want to overload those too much that it's um, creating more stress on our weakened positions. Um, so going off of it, again, back to the program, if we're looking at squat, um, a primary, uh, we might set at 60% based on one rep max, supplementals of that, 30% to 60% might be looking at five reps. Um, those are gonna be still a greater load, but not as much as the primary movement. We can look at safety squat bars, from squat, high bar, low bar, and then adding accessories with that external stabilizer to push more volume. So that's when we're looking at 10s, 15s, 20s uh, through leg press, hack squat, um, walking lunge, if they have the ability and they built that capacity to be able to perform that, um, hamstring curls, quad extensions. Um, keep in mind that there's always variations to exercise. There's never um, just an A, B, that there's an A1, B1. So going through that, if we're looking at a squat focus, ways to build around that squat or build up to that squat to be your center point um, might be a counterbalance squat, a goblet squat, a uh, front squat, high bar, low bar. Just in that, if we're following that program, that could be five months of programming in each block. And then from there, have listed a couple ways to modify that or uh, progress or regress those. Um, one thing to consider with your uh, training is adding autonomy to your training. So looking at giving that ownership to your client if they built to that point where they can handle that ownership. So thinking about instead of just set reps and sets, um, maybe we add some ranges and see how they do in there. Um, I have a saying that's called um, walk when you must, sprint when you can. So on our good days, let's try to take those ranges. Whereas on our bad days, we have built in where we can reduce down if, if needed. Um, looking at rep totals instead of reps and sets and maybe allowing the client to break their reps and sets down as needed. Uh, we can focus on tempo training, incorporating breathing. Um, looking at skills versus volume. So whenever we're going through these things, um, we don't, whenever we're loading like an A1 or a B1, uh, we don't want to go into technical failure. So we know when to pull back is if we're getting to technical failure, that's when we stop. Uh, whereas mechanical failure is more of a metabolic stressor. So that's adding volume. Um, that's whenever you get a like burning sensation or lactic acid buildup. Uh, and then again, driving adaptation through a barbell, dumbbell, cable, band, plate loaders. Um, keep in mind that all these things have a inverse relationship that is intensity drives up, frequency has to drive down and vice versa. That we don't want both of those um, driving up and breaking uh, breaking that level that we want to maintain that inverse relationship and we have to keep that in mind as we're going through and we're programming long term. Uh, the SRA curve is another uh, great model to keep in mind as we're trying to progress and trying to work through those um, meso and micro cycles um, that we want to ride that wave. So we're putting in um, a stimulus of adaptation, adding that stress going through, uh, giving the 48 to 72 hours for muscles to recover, going up through that recovery. Now we've progressed to a new level of adaptation. Week by week, we should be progressing. If you have inefficiencies in your web, uh, think about where the holes are. If you're too dependent on rep sets or load, um, are you overloading appropriately? Are you progressing them? And does your warm up integrate into your workout? Um, avoid entanglements. Um, is it too complex? Uh, are you just relying on an ABC model or are you integrating A1, B1 uh, as needed? Adding autonomy to um, your client's programming if they've uh, built up to that level, uh, forward uh, progression always. So always think about progressing, whether it's reps, whether it's pounds, whether it's um, time, tempo, rest periods making sure you're progressing that client because they shouldn't be doing in week one what they did in week four. Um, remember corrective exercise is just exercising good, going into good positions. Learning outcomes again. Um, here's some resources, uh, uh, pre-script uh, people, Vernon Griffith, uh, Corey Schlesinger, Mike uh, Boyle, that's kind of where I got some of these ideas or models from. 
Um, thank you to all of our sponsors that um, made this virtual conference happen. Um, make sure that you're following NERSA on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the website. And that's all I got for you. If um, you have any questions about anything I talked about today, um, if you are interested in some of the models that I described, feel free to email me. Um, there's my Instagram or a website if you'd like the digital copies of like that template.